Hey everybody, today I'm doing a stock analysis on Berkshire Hathaway stock, ticker symbol BRK. Now, most people know that Warren Buffett is a CEO and he runs the company. They are a portfolio holdings company that owns or partially owns a bunch of different companies. They also have a, a big investment portfolio as well. Their earnings just came out for 2023 and they were absolutely phenomenal. So I want to take a look at the company. I want to take a look at the stock and see what the fair value would be. The stock analysis video on Berkshire Hathaway is divided into four different sections. So the first one is business overview. What does this company do? Do they have any competitive advantages? The second one is a financial history, looking at a 10-year history of Berkshire Hathaway stock. The third is stock valuation. Now, I typically look at four different valuation methods. Now, Berkshire Hathaway is very unique, the way that their holding company is kind of set up. So my normal valuation methods that I use don't necessarily work with Berkshire Hathaway. So uh, there is one that I typically use that you'll see in this video, and then there's two new ones that you guys may have not seen on my channel before. So we'll go over all three of those. And last but not least, what is the return on investment that I would expect at the current stock price and a, pot a potential future stock price as well? So before we dive into the business overview of Berkshire Hathaway, uh, I do want to take a second and, and look at something in the 10K that just came out in the last week or so. And this was written by Warren Buffett, and he talks about Charlie Munger. So Charlie Munger unfortunately passed away November 28th, just 33 days before his 100th birthday. Most people know this, but Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett have been business partners since the, the 60s, and Charlie Munger has really guided Warren Buffett and transitioned him from buying cigar butt type stocks where, you know, he, Warren Buffett was looking at companies maybe that are, are you know, fair, fair companies that look really cheap that, you know, maybe you can buy into. And then um, even though that they're, they're kind of falling a, a apart, he's kind of buying at the very end. Hopefully they have some kind of uh, run up in profit, or at least maybe they have kind of a net net where, you know, maybe they have some extra cash or assets on the balance sheet that are worth more than maybe what the company is worth currently. Uh, but Charlie Munger really switched his mindset and said, you know, you really need to start buying great companies at fair prices instead of buying companies at great prices that are just fair companies. So that really mindset transition Warren Buffett into Berkshire Hathaway today. And he's taken that mindset and applied it over the last five decades. And it has been absolutely monumental. Warren Buffett goes on and explains that really Charlie Munger was the architect of the present Berkshire. And Warren Buffett really kind of thinks of himself as really being the general contractor that carried out the day-to-day -day construction of his vision. So Charlie Munger said, hey, Warren Buffett, this is what you need to do. This is you know how to build a company. And then Warren Buffett ran it so. Warren Buffett goes on to say, in the physical world, great buildings are linked to their architect, while those who had poured the concrete or installed the windows are soon forgotten. Berkshire has become a great company. Though I've been long in charge of the construction crew, Charlie should forever be credited with being the architect. So I thought that was really neat for, for Buffett to say where, yes, Buffett ran the day-to-day -day operations and he gets a lot of credit where Berkshire Hathaway is today, but really Munger helped him design and create the foundation of the company. Really, Charlie Munger should be giving a lot of credit where Berkshire Hathaway is at today. So what does Berkshire Hathaway do? This is straight out of their 10K. And they say, our goal at Berkshire is very simple. We want to own either all or a portion of businesses that enjoy good economics are fundamental and enduring. So these are companies going back to what Munger wanted, great companies at fair value. These are companies that have a strong moat, a competitive advantage. That way, competitors have a very difficult time trying to penetrate barriers. Coca-Cola is one of the best examples that Berkshire Hathaway owns because pretty much everybody in the world knows exactly what a Coca-Cola tastes like. Whether you go buy it in a restaurant, whether you buy it off a shelf at Walmart, you know it's going to taste the same. Now, I have heard that from country to country, there might be a slight difference, but certainly within the same country, it should taste very similar. And that brand is very recognizable. 
So what type of companies do Berkshire Hathaway outright own completely or partially own? And here's a selection of about 60 plus companies that they own. And a lot of them are very recognizable from Acme Brick Company to BNSF, which is a railroad company, Duracell, Geico Insurance, Hellsberg Diamonds, Johns Manville, Kraft Heinz, Pampered Chef, Seas Candy, and a lot more. Keep in mind, this does not even include their investment portfolio, which is completely separate. These are strictly businesses that they own outright or own a good majority percentage of. As of the last year in 2023, Berkshire by far had the largest gap net worth recorded by any American business. Record operating income in a strong stock market led to a year-end figure of $561 billion. The total gap net worth for the other 499 S&P uh, companies, a who's who of American businesses, was $8.9 trillion in 2022. The 2023 number for the S&P has not yet tallied, but it is unlikely to materially exceed $9.5 trillion. By this measure, Berkshire now occupies nearly 6% of the total universe of which it operates. So with all those businesses that they own, they touch over 5% of the world, which is absolutely impressive. This is what Warren Buffett talks about as really their competitive advantage or what separates them you know, from other businesses or just how they handle their own business. Warren says, occasionally markets and or the economy will cause stocks and bonds of some large and fundamentally good businesses to be strikingly mispriced. The reason for that is that the speed of communication and the vendors of technology facilitate instant worldwide paralysis, and Berkshire has come a long way since smoke signals. Such instant panics won't happen often, but they will happen. Berkshire's ability to immediately respond to market seizures with both huge sums and certainty of performance may offer them an occasional large-scale opportunity. So, for example, maybe there's a company like Dairy Queen, which they own, that they really liked a lot. And I'm just throwing a number out there. Maybe the company is worth a billion dollars. But for whatever reason, the markets, the economy are down. There's a lot of fear and uncertainty in the market. Market drops by, you know, 40%, but Dairy Queen drops 50%, gets pulled down with the rest of the market. Still a great business. That leads an opportunity for Berkshire Hathaway to step in and buy that entire business at a discount. So that would be an example where Berkshire could buy a great business at a great price. And they have certainly done that with a number of different companies that they own. One thing that Warren Buffett stresses is one investment rule at Berkshire has and will not change. They will never risk permanent loss of capital. Thanks to the American tailwind and the power of compound interest, the arena in which we operate has been and will be rewarding if you make a couple of good business decisions during a lifetime and avoid serious mistakes. And I think that is one of the most important statements that Warren Buffett or anybody can make in general. And Howard Marks talks about this exact same thing in his book called The Most Important Thing. And that is trying to build a portfolio of companies that you have low risk or you mitigate your risk and mitigate your losses. If you buy a company and it completely goes bankrupt, it can significantly put you behind. You have to double your money on the next business at the same price to even make up what you just lost. So risk is the key element on trying to avoid in order to get long-term gains. And speaking of long-term gains, if you were to buy into Berkshire stock back in 1965, you would have an overall gain of over 4 million percent against the S&P 500, which was up 31,000 percent. And that includes dividends as well. If you annualize that on a compounded growth rate, that is roughly 19.8% gain per year by buying Berkshire Hathaway stock versus only 10% of S&P. And I say only 10% because that's still a pretty good gain. But that really tells you how good Warren Buffett has been as a CEO if his stock has basically doubled the S&P 500 over the last five decades plus. 
with Berkshire Hathaway owning multi different companies across different industries. This is kind of how their earnings is divided up between the different sectors. So as far as insurance goes, about 15 billion out of the $96 billion of earnings that they saw in 2023 came from insurance directly. Another 5 billion came from railroad. Another 12 billion came from manufacturing, service, and retailing. But certainly the biggest gain was our investment and derivative contract gains of $58 billion, which is primarily tied to their investment portfolio. Here's a snapshot of Warren Buffett's portfolio, at least his bigger positions as of the end of 2023. This is pulled right off the Dataroma website. You can see on your screen, 50% of their portfolio is in Apple stock, 10% is in Bank of America, 8% is American Express, 6% is in Coca-Cola, and Chevron is at 5%. So their top five holdings are about 75% of their total portfolio. What's interesting though, even though 50% of their portfolio is in Apple stock, and put it in perspective, that's worth about $175 billion. Only about 16% of their total assets in Berkshire Hathaway are in Apple stock. So certainly 16% is a fairly large percentage, but it's not 50%. So in general, I would say Berkshire's net worth, about 15 to 16% is in Apple stock currently. And you can also see on your screen here that the two stocks they bought in the recent quarter was Chevron and Occidental, while they sold a little bit of Apple stock. So certainly, Warren Buffett has been putting more money into the energy sector. Between Chevron and Occidental alone, he's put in almost $35 billion in both of those companies. And going back to the results of operations screen here, it is extremely important to note and be aware of that their change in investment portfolio from year to year will make significant impacts on their earnings. But keep in mind, this is gap earnings, which means generally accepted accounting principles. And one thing that Warren Buffett has talked about over and over again is that he has a lot of frustrations toward gap accounting and what they have to put on their income statement. For example, if Apple stock were to drop 50% in one year, that would significantly impact the earnings of Berkshire Hathaway. However, what Warren Buffett has talked about is those earnings really shouldn't matter because they haven't sold the stock. You should only recognize the loss when you've actually sold the stock. So he believes it's not always a great representation of actual earnings and loss in a specific period of time. As you can see in 2022, the company recognized a $53 billion loss on their books because of the change in investment and derivative contract gain and losses in 2022, where in 2023, they saw a $58 billion gain. That's why, again, it can be very difficult on valuing Berkshire Hathaway depending on what value models you use. So next up, let's talk about a financial history for Berkshire Hathaway, and we're gonna go back 10 years on the company and really look at the big five, sales per share, earnings per share, free cash flow per share, book value per share, and also return on invested capital. In fact, return on invested capital, Warren Buffett talks about being the most important metric for investors. So we're gonna take a look at all those as well. And why do I look at an earnings per share basis? That kind of gives me a better picture and factoring in any share purchases and also share buybacks. In addition, we will be taking a look at some balance sheet metrics along with some cash flow metrics as well. So you see the big five on your screen here. You can see the company's market cap has gone from $370 billion in 2014 to nearly $1 trillion in market cap here today, currently sitting at around $903 billion dollars, which is one of the biggest companies in the entire world. You can see their sales per share has grown 9% per year over the last 10 years. Earnings per share has grown 21%. Free cash flow per share has grown 8%. Book value per share has grown 12%. And the return on invested capital has averaged 8%. You can see there's absolutely no red numbers on your screen, which would indicate that there's a problem. Quite the contrary, these are very consistent numbers and they've actually done even better over the last three years where we've seen sales per share grow 16% and earnings per share growing 34%. But also keep in mind that earnings per share is greatly affected like we talked about 
on their portfolio investments. So there can be some big swings year to year. When I look at Berkshire Hathaway specifically, I think book value per share growth is probably the most important factor because they own a lot of insurance companies and banks as well. And if you think about it, those type of businesses generate income by their assets. For example, a bank is going to loan out money and from that loan, they're gonna generate interest income. So the more assets they have on their books compared to say liabilities, the greater chance they're gonna be able to generate more income. And a 12% CAGR per year for book value per share is absolutely tremendous. Now let's take a look at some debt numbers and really look at the balance sheet overall. And these are some of the best numbers that I have seen, period, of any company out there. And having a massive company, nearly $1 trillion market cap, this is extremely impressive. So that, that first column there, long-term debt payoff versus their free cash flow, they could pay off all long-term debt in about 3.7 years. Their debt to equity is currently sitting at 23%, which is, I think, the best number I've seen of any company out there at all. So in general, they have very, very low debt on their books. This is a very, very well-managed company overall. Their current ratio, which is an indication of kind of where their working capital is at, it's at 3.4. So they have three times as many current assets as current liabilities. So this is one of the best balance sheets I have seen, period, of any company. And lastly, let's take a look at what the market multiple has been over the last 10 years, along with gross margins and operating margins overall. And as far as a PE goes, the average for the company, it's been around a 16 over the last 10 years. So on average, the market has been willing to pay a PE of 16, which also means or indicates the market is willing to get their money back in roughly 16 years based on earnings which if you look at the whole stock market over the last 100 years, the average PE has been around a 16. Now, as far as gross margins go, we've actually seen a compression there going from 85% in 2014 down to 76% over the last trailing 12 months, but they've averaged roughly 86% over the last 10 years. Now, operating margins have been up and down depending on the specific year that you're looking at. Now, on an average, they've been around that 20 to 21%, but it has significantly grown from 16% in 2014 to about 34% in the trailing 12 months. So overall, these are very, very impressive numbers. Having gross margins well into the 80%, having operating margins over 20%. It's a little surprising that that PE multiple isn't higher, but keep in mind, price to earnings is looking on a trailing multiple. However, stock prices really represent the future value of all potential earnings discounted back to today. So the PE not only reflects history, but it also tells you where the market thinks the company is going to go into the future. So here are all the numbers on one screen here. Not a single number is in red, which would indicate that there's a potential problem. These are some of the best numbers that I have seen uh, of any company. So they have one of the best balance sheets I've ever seen. They have not leveraged debt much at all. They have really, really good margins, but keep in mind, especially from the operating margin side, there can be a lot of inconsistency from year to year. And is really related to the different vast number of businesses that they own. What's also really important to note is really the last two years, the company has seen significant growth for sales, earnings, and even operating margins. So even though the stock over the last 50 to 60 years has more than doubled the S&P 500, that hasn't necessarily been the same from 2018 to now. In fact, 2018, 2019, the stock did not perform very well. And you can even see on the screen here, the return on invested capital is only 1% in 2018. However, the stock made some pretty significant gains in 2022 and in 2023. But the big question is, what should be the fair value of the stock here today? So let's go calculate that now. So in order to calculate the intrinsic value of the stock, we're going to be looking at three different models. So the first one is a discounted operating earnings model. The second one is an earnings yield model. And the third one is an investment yield model. If you've been watching my channel for a while. You may have not seen number two or number three 
on these valuation models. So this may be new to you, but like I've mentioned in this video a couple different times, Berkshire Hathaway is just a different business and you can't really value them the same way as a typical business. In my opinion, they're more built like an insurance company or a bank. So we're gonna be leveraging different other factors such as like return on assets, for example, and even more looking on the balance sheet metrics from assets and equity to really come up with a good intrinsic value. So let's go calculate those now. So the first model we're gonna be taking a look at is my discounted operating earnings model. This one is going to project operating earnings out into the future several years, discount it back to today. Depending on the multiple, it will give me an intrinsic share price for the stock. So I believe this, the sales is gonna go around roughly 8% per year. Keep in mind, the company has grown their sales over the last 10 years by 9% per year. In addition to that, I think operating margins were extremely high or higher than they normally would be in kind of normal years for the business. So in 2023, they came in around 34%, where I think a normalized operating margin for the business is around 22%. So actually, based on those numbers, several years out into the future, in 2028, I actually think they're going to have less operating earnings in that year than they did in 2023 based on these numbers. However, that still gives us a net present value future earnings roughly around $455 billion. With a multiple of 16, that gives me an intrinsic share price of $650,000. Now, keep in mind, there are two different types of Berkshire Hathaway stock. They have their A shares, and then they have their class B shares. These are the class A shares. These shares, they have never, ever, ever done a stock split in over 50 years. In fact, this is the most expensive stock in the stock market here today. Whereas if you look at their class B shares, they're less expensive, roughly, I think around $400 today. And currently the class A shares are trading at $615,000. The next valuation model I want to show is an investment yield. Now this one really does well with banks that are paying a dividend. Now Berkshire Hathaway does not pay a dividend, but I think this is still a decent valuation to kind of use to see where the stock is right now. And this one really leverages return on assets and looks at total assets versus equity on the balance sheet and says, okay, what is an average return of assets for the company? And I have 7.6%. So based on that return on assets, and they have a two to one ratio for assets to equity, they should be able to generate book value growth of about 14% per year, which is actually fairly in line to the historical book value per share growth that we've seen over the last 10 years, maybe slightly higher, but pretty darn close. So based on this information, I come with an expected return of about 12% per year. The next valuation here is an earnings yield. This is also a really good one to use really for banks or even insurance companies. This one does not factor in any kind of payout ratio or any kind of dividends. This one's truly really looking at, at return on assets, comparing to assets at equity to come up with a return on equity for the business, which I'm coming in around 14%. Based on a price to book, a normalized price to book that is of 1.58, I come up with an expected return of around 9% per year for the stock. So what would be my return on investment that I would expect to get based on some of the assumptions we just discussed? And just to make that clear or talk about it again, I think sales growth can be about 8% per year. The operating income growth, I think, is going to drop 1% per year. So it's going to be negative 1% per year over the next several years. And I think a market multiple for the company, an average historical one, which makes sense, is around a 16 and these are the values that are coming from my discounted operating earnings models. And again, these are the class A shares, not the B shares. The B shares are much lower numbers. So these are the class A shares. So for example, if they were $525 for one share, I would expect to get about 15% return per year over the next several years. If it was $428,000, I would expect around 20% per year. As of the day I'm recording this video, they are $615,000. So I'm coming up with roughly a 12% return per year. 
based on these forecasted assumptions, which is very in line with the investment yield valuation model that we went over earlier as well. So keep in mind that these are just assumptions. So if my assumptions are wrong, this valuation is going to be wrong. So for example, if their sales is not going to grow 8% per year, say it's only at 4%, or maybe their operating earnings is at negative 1% per year over the next several years, maybe it's negative 10%, that will significantly impact the valuation and the intrinsic value of this stock. And these valuations or assumptions also assume that over the next 10 years, we have a pretty standard or normal market and a pretty standard economy in general. Thank you for sticking all the way to the end of this video. If you're curious on how to support this channel or maybe you want to learn how to value companies yourself, I think that is one of the most important factors and should be a part of every analysis looking into companies and their company stock. And I do offer valuation templates on my Patreon. and actually explain to you how to use each one of those valuation templates as well. So if you're interested in that, I will put a link down below. You also get access to my stock analysis workbooks that I share in every single video I put on YouTube get access to my Discord channel with other value investors as well, and you get access to my Patreon-only posts. So if you're interested in that, again, I'll put a link down below. Thank you guys so much for watching this. And I'm really curious, what do you think about Berkshire Hathaway stock currently? Do you think it is worth the $615,000 for the Class A stock right now? Do you think it's undervalued, overvalued? Do you think my assumptions of, of sales at 8% per year, but having negative one operating income growth or loss per year over the next several years seems correct? I would love to hear from you guys in the comment section. I read every single one of those. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Catch you on the other side. Take care and God bless.